Abraham and the offering of Isaac. In the previous message of this series, we considered the implications around the birth of Isaac, the son of promise, and how that birth impacts us as Christians. I considered the seven natural and the seven spiritual parallels between the birth of Isaac, a type of Christ, and the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah of promise, as Isaac was the son of promise. In part nine of this series, we come to one of the best known stories concerning both Abraham and his son Isaac. God's call to offer him as a sacrifice upon Mount Moriah. Let's turn there, shall we? Genesis chapter 22. And this just fell off. <laughs> Stick it in there. Genesis 22, reading in the Amplified, beginning at verse 1. After these events, God tested and proved Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and then began the trip to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. And I and the young man will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in the fire pot in his own hand and a knife, and the two of them went on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, see, here are the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two went on together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there. Then he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He answered, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear and revere God, since you have not held back from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and glanced around, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering and an ascending sacrifice instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that since you have done this, 
and have not withheld from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. In blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the seashore. And your seed, your heir, will possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed, that is Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his servants, and they rose up and went with him to Beersheba. There Abraham lived. This is perhaps one of the most significant chapters in the entire Old Testament, as it sets forth a type for the core of the New Testament, the life, death, and resurrection of the only begotten Son of Almighty God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ we shall consider the various aspects of this typology as we examine this marvelous story. In verse 1, the word rendered as test or prove in many translations and incorrectly rendered as tempt in some versions is the Hebrew word nasa, 5254, five, that's N-A-S-A, and it is not the space agency. So no, th th this is not something about rockets going off. All right? But this word NASA means to refine or test the quality of something or someone through the application of stress, as a smith tested the quality of the metal he was working on. So it's to refine or test, to prove it, to check out its quality. Therefore, God was here about to test the quality of Abraham's faith. Not because God didn't know what that was. Of course he did. He knows everything. But rather, and this is a really important point, but rather it was to show Abraham and eventually his descendants, including ourselves, just how great was the quality of his faith. God always tests us for our betterment, not his. Here, God was about to test both Abraham's faith and his obedience, two qualities which are still absolutely essential in our daily Christian walk. And as I said, the point that I think is important is that it was not so that God could learn about it, because God already knew how great was his faith and that he would obey. It was so that Abraham would learn and understand what faith he had and how much obedience he would give to his Lord. You see the, the, the key? That's what happens when God tests us. He doesn't test us in any way so that he can find out how we will respond. It's so that we can learn how we will respond in that testing situation. So that to me is a really significant point to grasp and understand because God always is testing us. In one way or another throughout our lives, he tests us. And it's for our benefit. It's so that he can refine us, so that we can see that refining work. We can see, as many people have shared, the changes in our lives 
since we gave our lives to him. And to me, that is so essential for us to understand. When God tests us, it's for our betterment, for our benefit, not his. He already knows. Verse 2 is surely one of the most incredible verses in all of Scripture. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I will tell you. I can't even imagine what the impact of that request would have been on Abraham, who would likely have been about 133 years old at this point in time. Here was the miraculous son of promise, whom he loved dearly, about to be sacrificed by his own father on an altar. We're told elsewhere in Scripture that God never tests us beyond what we can bear. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, for those who want to note it. But I certainly wouldn't ever want to be, to have to face such a test. I can't imagine what it would be like. Many of his here are fathers. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. I don't know if God asked that of me or asked it of you. You know, it, to me, it's just so incredible. I, I hope I never had to try to face such a test. Mind you, I don't expect I'll be around at 133, but... Note also the progression God uses. Your son. Your only son. Isaac. And then those three key words, whom you love. What's really significant here is that this is the first time that the word love is used in the Old Testament. When I started doing research on this, I didn't realize that. This is the first time the word love is used in the Old Testament. Your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And what's even more significant is that the first time the word love is used in the New Testament is when God declares in Matthew 3 and verse 17... And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Fascinating. The things in Scripture that we don't even realize. But the first time that the word love appears in the Old Testament is in connection with Isaac as I'm attempting to show a type of Christ, and the first time the word love is, appears in the New Testament is the, our Heavenly Father speaking about his beloved Son, Jesus. The parallels are just astounding, and sometimes they just slip by us and we don't even notice them. As we shall clearly see, Isaac is indeed a type of Christ, at least in this passage we're examining today. Further to this, though there are plenty of disagreements among the scholars and commentators, as many as you know, I comment on the fact that they, they all insist that they're correct and they all totally disagree with one another. It's fun to try and read some of them. But even though there are disagreements, many believe that the mountain God planned to use was actually Calvary. Not what became known as Temple Mount. You can have a fascinating time exploring this further for homework if you're interested in the arguments for and against. But I like the symmetry of the type of Isaac and the type of our Lord. 
And I like the symmetry that this very well may have been Calvary, where Abraham took Isaac. As I said, the commentators disagree, and it's a fascinating area to research, as you, you can read backwards and forwards, those who say this, those who say the other, and I'm sure some of you will enjoy doing that. And then you can discuss it and have a lot of fun. Again, we find the same disagreements over what age Isaac was. Some say 25, others claim 35, but I prefer 33, the same age as our Lord when he too visited Calvary. He was definitely not a young boy. This means he went willingly to the sacrifice, as did our Lord. Some things to ponder later over a coffee while we're having lunch together. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and then began the trip to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. So, Abraham took two men with him in addition to Isaac. Some have suggested that one of them was Ishmael, but that just doesn't seem right to me. Not in the context, not in the typology, but some have suggested it was Ish one of them was Ishmael. I don't believe it to be, but I'm open to someone with a convincing argument, but that just doesn't seem right. Now, in Scripture, two is the number of witness as well as the number of Christ. And our Lord went to his sacrifice between two thieves who were with him as witnesses. Note also that it was on the third day that they arrived at the mount. Something amazing was to happen on that third day. And again, this is but a type of our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection, all laid out here for the world to see, yet none did. Verse 5 clearly illustrates one aspect of Abraham's great faith in the promises of Almighty God. This is interesting, note it. And Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here, with the donkey, and I and the young man will go yonder and worship and come again to you. What is important to note here is the absolute assurance Abraham had that both he and Isaac would return, even though he knew he had been commissioned to sacrifice his son on the mount. That surely is a display of incredible faith. No wonder Abraham is credited as the father of faith. This is echoed again in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter, verses 17 to 19 in the New King James. That's Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The general consensus concerning verse 19 is that for the three days Abraham and Isaac traveled to the mount, Abraham 
considered his son dead. Therefore, as a figure or type, Isaac also becomes an example of the resurrection. Now, just as an aside, because I want you to see a pattern eventuating here in this series. As you know, the patriarchs I'm looking at are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We clearly have seen that Abraham, the father of faith, the father of many nations, is clearly a type of Almighty God. Isaac, the son of promise, is clearly a type of of Jesus. Guess who Jacob is going to be a type of? Any? Hmm? I think it should be pretty obvious. You're going to have to wait a while before we get to Jacob and see how he fits into this trinity. I just think it's another fascinating parallel that we have our trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then we have the trinity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're seeing those parallels. So that's something you can think about and contemplate when I get to Jacob. How am I going to match him with the Holy Spirit? Wait and see. Verse 6. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in the fire pot in his own hand and a knife, and the two of them went on together. Once more, we see similarities in the typology. Isaac bore the wood on which he was to be bound, and Christ bore his cross all the way to Calvary. God is precise, even in the smallest details. Verse 6 also tells us that Abraham took fire in his own hand. In Scripture, fire is always a symbol of divine judgment, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Consider Genesis chapter 3 verses 22 to 24 in the New King James. Genesis 3, beginning at the 22nd verse. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And then in Revelation chapter 20, Verses 14 and 15 in the New King James. Revelation 20. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Genesis to Revelation. Fire symbolizes God's divine judgment. Verse 7 and 8 of Genesis chapter 22 are extremely profound in their eternal significance. Verse 7. And Isaac said to Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, see, here are the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two went on together. Other versions of verse 8 actually add more clarity for once than the Amplified. 
Surprising as that may be. The New King James, Genesis 22, verse 8, says this. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. It is essential to note two things here. Firstly, it was then and always would be God who provided the lamb necessary for the forgiveness of sin. And secondly, this lamb was for himself and no other. Think about it for a moment. Who else but Almighty God could provide a sacrifice worthy of him? Who else but God on high could meet the divine requirements of such a sacrifice? There was nothing which any man could supply to meet that need. Only God could do so. And only the divine Lamb of God, his Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, could meet those divine requirements. Thus it was with Abraham and Isaac, and thus it is with us. When Jesus died on that cross at Calvary, he was not only dying to reconcile sinners, to bring forgiveness to mankind, but he was doing so to fulfill the requirements of a just, holy, and righteous God, and to declare such righteousness before all men. Paul expresses it well in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. You don't need to turn there. I'll read it from the Amplified. But Romans chapter 3 and verse 26 says this. It was to demonstrate and prove at the present time in the now season that he himself is righteous and that he justifies and accepts as righteous him who has true faith in Jesus. One thing we often overlook is the attitude of Isaac towards all of this. Remembering that by this time, he was a fully grown man of about 33 years, while his father was well over 130 years of age. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there. Then he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. The question one could ask is why didn't Isaac protest and refuse to allow himself to be bound to the altar? Surely he could have easily overpowered his very elderly father. You can imagine, strapping 33-year-old and 133-year-old Abraham. Right? Comes to a contest, who's going to win? You know. <laughs> so what we have here is once, an, once again an example of type. An example of total submission to the will of the Father, both in the natural, as here with Abraham and Isaac, and in the spiritual, with Christ and his Father. Matthew 26 and verse 39 says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Did Isaac trust his father? Did Isaac trust God? 
Perhaps he trusted both. But actually, the answer is immaterial. What is clear is that, like Christ, he submitted to the will of his Father. And that should be the lesson we learn from his example. It's interesting to note that this is the last we hear about Isaac in this chapter. Even when Abraham returns to the two men, there is no mention of Isaac, as if he were left up on the mount. Verse 19 says, So Abraham returned to his servants. Abraham returned. And they rose up and went with him to Beersheba, there Abraham lived. No mention of Isaac. Interesting. Many commentators ascribe this to being a further example of typology, with this lack of mention of Isaac being symbolic of the resurrection. I'll leave that for you to decide. We've got plenty to discuss over lunch. Things to whet your appetite. What then are all the types of Christ we see in this story? For there are a great many, some of which we have already considered in both this message and my previous one in the series. First of all, they were both supernatural births engineered by Almighty God for his purposes, one for a nation and the other for all mankind. Next, both Isaac and Jesus were sons of promise, and both came at a time specified by God and not by man. Abraham waited over 30 years for the promise of Isaac to be fulfilled, while the nation of Israel, and in fact the entire world, had to wait hundreds of years for the arrival of the promised Messiah. Sadly, some are still waiting. Both were called the only begotten son. And as we saw earlier, both were loved. Isaac, of course, by Abraham, and Jesus by his heavenly father. They both carried the wood for their sacrifice on their shoulders up to the Mount of Calvary, where both of them, where both were then laid upon that wood. Both Isaac and Jesus consented to suffer death and both consented to be bound to the wood, or in Jesus' case, to the cross. Jesus made this very clear. John chapter 10, verses 15 to 18 in the New King James. That's John chapter 10, beginning at verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Both men were offered by their fathers and ultimately by God himself. It was by his command that this occurred. These sacrifices were, I believe, being offered on that same hill, the one we call Calvary, when both were about the age of 33 and in the prime and vigor of their life. It was always their choice to submit. What an example of perfect submission. 
And we're going to finish by singing that hymn shortly. Of prime significance is the fact, as already mentioned, that in both cases, it was God who provided the lamb, not man. God is our total provision in all things. There can never be anything of ourselves involved in his redemptive work. It has always been his work and his alone. Nothing we can do through our efforts will achieve anything in and of itself. Only that which we do through the power of the Holy Spirit will have any lasting effect. I'm reminded of that line from another old hymn. Nothing of ourselves we bring, simply to the cross we cling. Finally, while both were dead for three days and three nights, Christ literally and Isaac in a figure or type, both lived again, were resurrected after the offering. Again, for Jesus, it was literal, while for Isaac, it was as a type. What a remarkable number of parallels. Was it sheer coincidence, or was this always a part of God's eternal plan of salvation? I think the answer to that question is obvious. After concluding the central event of Genesis chapter 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, the rest of this chapter serves two basic purposes. Firstly, it repeats and therefore reinforces the covenant promises which God made with Abraham and which were the subject of an earlier message in this series. Verses 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And it's clear the angel of the Lord is almighty God. And said, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord. That's a key there. I've sworn by myself. You might recall Jesus talked about that in the book of John. I did a message concerning that a few years back. That since you have done this, and have not withheld from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. In blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore. And your seed, your heir, will possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. Possibly the most significant point in these verses comes in verses 17 and 18, which speaks of the seed, singular, which refers clearly to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is against him that the gates of hell will not prevail. And it is through him that all the nations of the earth have been blessed with the opportunity for possessing everlasting life. The final verses of this chapter may seem like an addendum, with them being just a list of genealogies. Verses 20 to 23. Now after these things it was told Abraham, Milka has also borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Camul, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazel, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. However, one of those names is most significant. Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, was eventually to become the wife of Isaac and the mother of Jacob. But we shall consider that in more detail in a later message, probably the next one. For now, I want to leave you with one final thought. And musicians might want to come up as we're going to 
They're going to lead us in this great hymn in a minute. God, in his great wisdom, put two of his patriarchs through a great trial and testing as a forerunner, a type of what lay in store for his only begotten son, all so that we would be the beneficiaries of this incredible event, this incredible sacrifice. Therefore, what will be your response? Will you pass this off as just another interesting story? Or will you allow its significance to penetrate your heart and show you your need of a personal savior? The Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't escape that simple fact. We're all sinners who deserve death because the penalty for sin is death and eternal separation from God. However, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, like his earlier type Isaac, has willingly laid down his life so that all who believe in him might be saved. If you have never acknowledged that you are a sinner, if you have never repented of that sin and made the choice to turn your life around and follow Jesus, if you have never been born again, then before you leave today, please take the time to speak with one of us about doing that very thing. May the Lord richly bless you all.